Hi, and welcome to the DP World Tours Life on Tour podcast. I'm your host, Ewan Porter. And in today's episode, we're chatting to a man who captured the imagination of the golf world a couple of weeks ago with an emotional fourth DP World Tour victory. Richie Ramsey, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, boys. Thanks for having me on. Well, you played the Hero Open last week. You finally got a week off this week. Uh, what's on the agenda? Um, just uh, just chilling out, replying to a lot of messages, which has been really nice. Um, and just uh, I've sort of put the clubs away for a few days and just been just been trying to get in the gym. Had a had a really good gym session today. And a Pilates session after, which was was brilliant. It was tough, but uh, you know, trying to trying to keep mobility, keep the weight off, keep the strength up. Really, well, I'm sure it's been a bit of a whirlwind since your victory at Hillside. Uh, have you had the opportunity now to reflect on that win, your first in seven years? Yeah, um, you know, obviously, just like some gets some time to myself, just quiet time. You think about it and. Um, you could tell, obviously, it meant uh, it meant a lot to me, um, and sort of I think the reason for that was that in be- in between the third and the fourth win, like you go through peaks and troughs, and I think I went through quite a few troughs where I was like maybe fall out of love with the game a little bit and. Um, it becomes harder than it's ever been before and, and f- more mentally than anything. And um, that's probably why it was so satisfying that the, the difference between being at the bottom and the top was greater than ever. Um, and I'm a huge believer that adversity or difficulty is a, is a great motivator and driver. And so, so to go from being sometimes maybe at the bottom and rising again up rising again up to the top was was why that emotion i think was there and that kind of release it you know seven years is a long time so it, it was bottled up a bit do you think those hard times make you appreciate it a little bit more when you do have some success oh definitely yeah because you know belief is a is a fantastic thing like if you can believe in something it's it's huge for you but to actually go out there and do it is a different matter um and yeah you just you just realize that like these moments are special and you realize you know I've played golf for professional for 15 years I would sort of classify playing golf properly since I like training and doing all since I was 15 16 so you're talking over 20 years and um you know to win four times out there you normally lose more than you win and um and it's just to to appreciate those times and to really kind of just soak them all up and really enjoy them um because they don't happen that often well no doubt the the turf the lynx style uh, golf course there at hillside make made you feel right at home you also played really well there at hillside back in 2019 you finished fifth in a star-studded field that week. Uh, did you have any inkling at the beginning of the week a couple of weeks ago that it was going to be your time? Um, I've been playing really good, but I'd been struggling with a bit of, of injury, um, and I managed to put that behind me. And Hillside was always one. There was opportunities to go to the States. So I said, I'm not giving up the chance not to arrive at Hillside fully prepared because I said to someone before that like Hillside and the Fairmont were the, the last two weeks. Lynx golf, that's where I tend to to do well. And as I said to someone without sounding or trying to sound sort of arrogant, I said, those are, those are courses I can win on. Like I was convinced I could win on those courses because I'd done well before, like you say. And I played on the hillside since I was 16 on and off for a number of years. Um, and when I arrived there, I felt, I felt comfortable. You know, you feel... Like you don't need to do, don't need to hit a lot of balls. The ground was firm and fast. You really had to think your way around the golf course. Notice where, on downwind holes, notice where the the slopes were. Where if you pitch at one place, it'll it'll land and stop into the hill, or if you pitch at another place, it'll shoot forward, and that's that's a release. So, um, I took that all into account, but I I kind of knew the golf course before I got there. I knew how to play the holes. 
So there's an element of being, right, okay, I hit it here, right, and then when the pin's on that side, okay, I don't attack that pin. Next hole, right, I want to hit it here, right, it's a green light flag, let's go at that one. So um, I had a game plan and and it just puts you, puts you at ease when you've played a course that, that many times. Well, that familiarity with Lynx golf, uh, did it make it, did that make it even tougher for you missing out on the Scottish Open and the Open Championship in your homeland the two weeks prior to the Kazoo Classic? I mean, it's probably a, it was probably, it probably worked both ways in the fact that I'm sure you were fresh coming into Hillside and that helped you win, but no doubt you were probably a bit gutted not playing those two uh, big championships. Yeah, especially because the way the weather's been in Scotland, it's been really dry. And and the courses are playing, I think as they should should do, which is firm and fast. And I th- I think when you have those types of conditions, that's when I thrive more. I'm not I'm not I'm not a massive high spin player. Like I don't hit it up in the the air like McElroy or anything. But my skill is in sometimes noticing things that other people don't. So instead of actually looking at the green, like I said, you're going to have to pitch it short. Like where, if I pitch it on a, on a fairway, is it going to kick forward? And where is my optimum place to hit it off the tee? Um, and how do I access flags? Particularly around St Andrews, you know, you're going to have to work the ball because if, if you put all the flags on the left-hand side and the wind's off the down off the left, which is a prevailing wind on the front line, you're gonna to have to hold it up, hit hit um hit some nice draws in there, and then, consequently, if the pins are on the right, um, and you have that right to left win on the back, you're gonna to have to hold it up. So, shot making comes into it, and I and I like that. I like you know right. I don't really see straight lines. I mean that sounds funny, but I see movement all the time, even if it's even if it's a yard, two yards movement. I like to work the ball. Well, you played the final group that Sunday at Hillside with a relatively unknown Frenchman in Julian Guerrier. Uh, it was a congested leaderboard. Did you feel like uh, your experience being in those type of situations before uh, helped you get across the line that day? Oh, definitely, yeah. Um, I've known Julian for a number of years and um, he is he's a hell of a player. Um, when I won the US Amateur, he the same year won the British Amateur. So mm. I used to see him quite a bit that year and I knew what type of game he had. Um, he's obviously got a lovely, like very fluid swing, can hit the ball quite far. And there was a number of guys at the top of the board that I thought, you know, are good players. But I knew that after nine holes, he he, he was doing well. He, you know, he made an unbelievable three on nine, which was just a crazy three. But I was like, you know what? Every hole on the back nine hillside, the pressure is going to ramp up. And every time I hit a good shot, the pressure is going to be on him. Um, and I felt comfortable in that environment. I think the golf course helped me from the viewpoint that every tee shot on that back nine, there's an element of pressure. And there's not really a tee shot that runs in the same direction. So when you're changing wind direction, you need to be able to shape it. Um, and like I say, that plays into my plays into my hands, and I just I love that. I just love Sunday back nine last group. Like, tell me what you want, and that's that's everything I want. I want the pressure to be on. I want I want the chance to hit a shot when you need to hit it under the gun when the tournament's on the line when people are watching you. What are they expecting? Um, and that that's what I really train for is is those moments. Well, the emotion came pouring out, uh, as you mentioned, on the 18th green. You had told your daughter that you were going to bring her home a trophy. You did. Uh, how did all that come about? Um, yeah, so in, in the house, I'm fortunate. Um, I've got a couple of trophies and and she was looking at them one day and she's like, oh, you know, I like those. Those are quite nice. And she was looking at the names and stuff on it. Um, and she's like, I want, I, oh, I said to her, I said, like, do you want a trophy, your own trophy? And yeah, Dad, I want I want a trophy. And so and I said, where are you going to put it? I'm going to put it on here, okay? Um, and I'll stay in your room. So from that day onward, every time I left the house, I would say, right, I'm going away to get you a trophy. And she'd be like, okay. 
And a lot of times I'd come back and she, I could see her little face. She'd look up at me and she'd be like, Dad, if you have a trophy for me, you know, the anticipation. And I was like, no, I, did, I didn't win a trophy, but I keep trying. I never give up. And um, she, she like this carried on for a long time. And I could see it kind of getting to the point where she was like, no, I'm, I'm probably not going to get a trophy. You know, her, her kind of faith was dwindling a bit. Um, and then obviously I said to her, like, I, I, I never give up. Like, that's the one thing I'm, I'm very good at. And when I say something to her, I always mean it. I, I'll, I won't, I will never break that promise to her. And, um, yeah, it was very cool. She got to watch the the last few holes with Angela and, and, and get to see the puck go in. It was quite cool. She, she was watching it and the commentator said something along the lines of, well, that trophy is for Olivia. She'll get one. And she just looked up and she goes, yes, it, my, a trophy for me, my trophy. <laughs> So she, she's going to have the coolest. Um, I, I don't know if she's taken it to uh, show and tell at school or anything yet, but she's going to have the coolest little gift there to to show everyone. Yeah, yeah, she was um, she was delighted. So uh, yeah, she she she'll have that in her bedroom for a long time to come. <laughs> well, we'll come back to uh, some of this later, and and the winning putt, the hold that you, excuse me, the putt that you hold to win. Uh, we've seen you hold a putt of that length before that uh, really mattered as well. But um, going back to where it all began for you, uh, growing up in Aberdeen, you played at the historic Royal Aberdeen Golf Club. Uh, How did you get into the game of golf? And when was it around that 15, 16 mark that you mentioned uh, that you really decided to give golf a proper crack? Yeah, I mean, my my grandfather got me into golf, really. I was was a tiny wee kid. you know, I'd have plastic clubs, you know, three, four, five years old in the, in the back garden. And, um, but golf was never really my first thing, you know, playing football was my big thing, you know, sport at Aberdeen, um, you know, during the, the late eighties, early nineties, when we had a, a great team, um, you know, Ian, Jess, Hines, Gilhouse, Theo Snell, there's, um, you know, McLeish Miller was at the end of his career, but a lot of, great players and I want to be a footballer um but as you got older I realized you know there was a lot of people who were much better at football than I was um and I slowly got into more golf and my grandfather would take clubs and cut them down and put tape around them and he would have his his dog Ranza go up to Hazelhead um golf course and you know he would sniff a golf ball head off into the trees and come back with a ball and so I plenty of practice balls to hit um, and my, my grandfather was very stern. He was an RAF pilot in 612 squadron. Um, and then he became a head teacher after that. So he was, you know, he would, he taught me a lot of lessons. Um, but at the same time he had a soft spot for me cause he loved his golf and I loved the golf. Um, and, uh, yeah, it got to the point where 13, I think 14, 15, I played in the under 16s, Scottish under 16s finished second. And I was really disappointed because I thought to myself, I could have won that. And I realized that if I'm finishing second without applying myself as much as I could, then, you know, I could definitely win that the next year. And that's where things started to take off. That's where, you know, I would, I would, I would go to the gym on the, at lunchtime, you know, I take a packed lunch. Mum would cook, have me a packed lunch, and I I go there and I go to the gym, while the kids were out playing or doing whatever. And I and I just looked at it as like, look, I'm gonna do whatever it takes, to be the best I can be and give myself the best chance. Um, and if that means sacrificing, you know, time with my friends or, or going out or doing different things, I was willing to take that. And and it was tough because when you see your friends going out or going on holidays in the summer and stuff, it's um, it's not ideal. But I, I have something. I don't know what. I don't know a way to describe it. That you know, I don't like losing, but I have something that I apply to my golf that allows me to be singly focused and be like. Right, this is what I'm going to do. This is what we've got to do. I'm going to, I've got to smash this because in my heart of hearts, if I 
get to a point and I don't give 100%, I can't, I can't live with that. If I give 100% and don't win, I'm fine with it. But uh, anything less than that doesn't really, doesn't really stack up. Growing up uh, playing junior golf, did you have a lot of friends that you used to play golf with uh, of an afternoon? I know for myself growing up, uh, you know, every opportunity I had after school, I was down at the golf club having chipping comps, putting comps, playing as many holes before dark as I could with my friends. Uh, and I think ultimately that, you know, really helped me go on to have a, a career in golf. And with yourself as well, was it, uh, was it the same sort of thing or did you find yourself playing with uh, older people? Um, definitely the... You know, playing 36 holes in the summer, you know, going up to originally at Hazelhead and playing with the folk from school and uh, chipping contests, putting contests, playing for a Mars bar. And then, you know, once I got older, I say I joined Royal Aberdeen and we won the junior pennant three years in a row. And we had a great team, 10 guys, um, just a great laugh. I, You know, I was normally one pairing, top pairing, but I think... I know I, st- I still have, a, I've got a WhatsApp group with the boys up to this day. Um, and and they're, they've always been great supporters of me. They supported me from the get go. And that's nice to have people who were there at the start and are still here. Um, but yeah, that was, you know, going to junior opens, um, playing at, playing at Royal Aberdeen, you know, caddying at Royal Aberdeen. It was all good fun and it was great fun. And then, you do get to a point where you have to play with older players because they're better and need to challenge your game. But um, those guys have always stuck stuck with me, and um, and they were they were one of the first guys to send me a text and congratulate me. You also attended uh, a community college in a small town in Texas called Waco. Um, you went to you went to Stur- Sterling University in your homeland as well. What were what were some of the major differences between the two, and what were the opportunities and pathways that they were providing for you at the time? Yeah, I went to uh, McLennan Community College. Um, I, lo- I loved it out there because I was kind of free. I was free to do, you know, practice, go to school. Um, my my biggest problem was there wasn't the people to push me. And I, and I don't mean that from the coach's perspective. I mean, from I was playing in a community college and I, I could win matches without giving like 100%. And I needed people around me who were better because being number one on a team is great. Being number one in like a county or district is great. But I was always like, I need to be number one in the country. Like I need to be the best out there. And I need, and in order to be that, I felt I need to compete against the best. Um, and I, I also felt that during that time, I needed to improve my game. I got a glimpse of what the professional ranks were like, and I, I felt that my game needed an overhaul. Um, and and that was one of the reasons I came back to Sterling. It allowed me to um, have a closer relationship with my coach Ian Ray, and then. Sterling University is a, is is a brilliant place. It's great to go to the gym. You can practice, but um, that social side was just fantastic. Four years where, you know, there's not phones like you have now, <laughs> so you can get away with a bit more. Um, but it was just um, brilliant times and and um, arguably some of the best times of your life. When it's nothing to do about golf, it's just enjoying life. Um, being out there and, and having close relationships with people that you continue to this day. You did have an illustrious amateur career because you won the Irish Amateur Championship, the Scottish Stroke Play, uh, played the Walker Cup, but uh, no question, uh, your biggest win as an amateur was at Hazeltine in 2006 when you became uh, the first British-born player in almost 100 years to win there, and that must have been an incredibly memorable week. Yeah, it was... Um it was it was a brilliant week. Uh, we were really fortunate that we we went out as a as kind of a team, a GBNI team. Um, it was myself, Rob Dunwoody, Reese Davis, Solly Fisher, Lloyd Saltman, uh, Steve Tyler was there as well. So we all kind of hung about together, um, and I think that was one of the reasons why we did well because you weren't on your own. There was always guys there that you knew, played practice rounds together, um, 
and it was just a, it was it was just a week where the golf course set up really well for me. It was a really tough setup. Like if you missed a fairway, you were kind of wedge out, um, and I just felt that my game was peaking at the right time. And from the quarterfinals on, I completely believed. I could win it and that was the biggest thing I, I think belief like I said before belief is a huge thing but when you're mentally in the right place and you believe you can do something um there is no limit and um I, I loved that atmosphere again talk about pressure the first time I'd really been you know tv cameras there's like five thousand people out there which when you're an amateur is a lot of people to watch in on every hole um and I played under the gun. I played great. I kind of hardly, I missed, I think I missed like three fairways in 34 holes and about four greens. So from a max play perspective, I just pressurized and pressurized. And um, and then when you see the trophy and you see the names, it starts to kind of dawn on you what's going on. Um, and it's it's a it's a very cool thing to have. Well, for someone who grew up playing on Lynx golf courses, and uh, obviously you have a real affinity for that style of golf that you mentioned earlier, Hazeltine National, I mean, you really couldn't get too much of a, a polar opposite of a style of golf course. It's long, it's soft. Uh, so what, what, what clicked that week? What made you enjoy uh, that facility so much? Um, I think the, the, the camaraderie definitely of the guys were out there, GB and I guys, um, the the family that we stayed with that week the bullers they were fantastic they just like like you play golf cook your meals at night um but i definitely think that the camaraderie because one of the, one of the coolest things that happened after our one was that, that the week after we were all playing sanders links trophy which was in the check and most of the boys had taken off um, earlier than me and I wasn't getting a fight till the Monday. So I think I had to go from Minnesota to the Czech and like it was like plane, car, plane and then like a three-hour drive somewhere and I arrived really late at night, I think maybe on the Tuesday, maybe on the Tuesday night and it was like, it was like 10, 10.30 at night and I was like, see this hotel and there's a few lights on you're like, oh, nobody will be up. Um, and I walked in and I remember clear as day, like all the boys that I look up, you know, all the guys that I played golf with, uh, you know, Rory was there, Ross McGowan, Reese, all the guys that I look around and think, geez, you've got great games, you great players, you know, you've got a huge future ahead of you. And Colin Douglas, they were all there. And as I walked in, they started clapping and cheering, lots of hugs. Um, and that camaraderie, I thought that was that was that was one of the coolest moments because I was like the people I play with, the people like I care when they say something to me, um, waited up for me and were there to congratulate me. And and I think having some of them out at Hazeltine really made the week pretty special. That win uh, really put you on the map, and some of the names that you mentioned then: uh, Rory McIlroy, uh, Ross McGowan, Reese Davies. Uh, You've only got to look at that 2007 Walker Cup. Uh, there were so many strong names playing amateur golf at the time. And the first ever edition of the World Amateur Golf Rankings came out uh, at the beginning of 2007 and you topped those. You were number one. Uh, that must have meant a hell of a lot to you. Yeah, I mean, you know, I talked about going to, to Waco and that idea that I wanted to be number one. Um, and I think when I came back in... It must have been like 2001, I think. I sat down with my coach, Ian Ray, and we're like, you know, what do you want to do? I said, well, I need, I need to get better. I need the ability that when I turn pro, I have the best chance. I had a good game, but not a great game. And um, over the course of those years, particularly in the winters, I would grind it out and then I felt that my game would be elevated every every summer. Um, and that ranking was a consequence of all those years, and it you know it didn't happen overnight. It was probably four, five, six years of work that it took to get my game to the best it can be. Um, and it's a cool thing to look back on because there's not many people 
that can say they're number one in the world. And when you look at the amount of amateurs there are and the strength and depth and all the places that we play golf these days, um, it's quite a, quite a special thing to have on my CV. Yeah, absolutely. Well, winning the US Amateur Championship, uh, one of the perks of that was that it qualified you for three of the four major championships in 2007. And unfortunately, uh, you missed the cut in, in those three majors. But what did you learn about yourself um, from those starts? Um, I learned that the the core of my game was good. The ability to drive the ball straight, the ability to hit irons on numbers, shape the ball was really good. The ability to grind a score out, the short game, maybe maybe not so much the mental side, but the ability to score when you're not on and and really the short game was, it was kind of, it was laid bare and I needed to improve on that. And that, that was something that I kind of noticed. I felt comfortable in the environment and it was nice to dip my feet in there while not being pro. Um, and I just felt that if I could get a good run and, and make life a little bit simpler, because I'd been traveling quite a lot at that time, going back and forth with, like you say, playing Lynx golf one week and then playing in America the next, I never sort of settled. Um, and I felt that when I settled and I stayed in Europe and managed to do all the things that uh, made me feel good, that my game would, would prosper and turn in pro after the Open, a lot of people were kind of critical of that that move. Um, but the people around me who are close to me and views that I respect were kind of like, you know, I th- we think you're ready, we think you're good. And and most importantly, I thought I was ready. So the end up playing the Challenge Tour, which was uh, just fantastic breeding ground. Like just every week you're there, you're competing against good players, good courses, traveling, learning your trade. Um, that was a, a great thing for me. I think you made an excellent point there. And I, I personally think I have, I have a lot to do with um, juniors coming through in Australia and a lot of amateur golfers. And I think one of the most underappreciated aspects is they're all so talented. They can all shoot 65, 66 when they play well, but the ability to be able to grind out something better than par when you've got your B or C game, I think is the most underrated aspect of, of being an elite player. Yeah, it's it's um it's not the it's not the three woods that you hit round a tree over a over a pond that go to twenty feet. Those are the ones that are on the highlight reel and that's what everybody remembers. But they don't remember the the holes where you kinda like on the fairway, hit a seven iron to 25 feet, you make a good two putt, hit it in the bunker on the next, get it up and hit it into four feet, hold the putt. It's those holes that you grind it out, that you grind a score. And it always amazed me when I play with the top players in the majors, how, how they might, you know, you look at their scorecard and you'd be like, right, he shot 69. How did he shoot 69? Like, I didn't think he played that well. And you're like, well, didn't hit it in any fairway bunkers. You know, strategy was good. Didn't when he hit a bad shot, wasn't a ca- ca- catastrophe. Didn't have any penalty strokes. Putted and chipped well, and he, he shot sixty nine. And that was a real kind of like. And then I look at my scorecard and be like, shot seventy six, and there's like seven shots difference. And it's it's the ability to do it under the gun as well. It's like because everybody could do it when there's no pressure on. It's like you need to do it when you're in a tournament, and that's a that's a a skill that you need to really need to learn over time um mm. it is it is an integral part of being successful and reflecting on those three major championships i'm pretty sure you couldn't have got through or picked three harder venues because zach johnson won the masters that year with one over i think five over won the us open at oakmont carnoustie is arguably the hardest course on the open rotor so you, you had a real challenge ahead of you for those three didn't you yeah th- those were um i thought i thought <laughs> Jeez, is this, is this what it's like every year at the Masters? Because I was looking at previous scores, I'm like, how are you shooting 15 under around here? I think it was like, it was just under par, I think maybe won the Masters. Um, and then Oakmont is just an absolute bear. Like, I mean, it's maybe the hardest course in the US. Um, and love the golf course, uh, but just so tough. Um and then obviously Carnoustie is is a 
brilliant golf course. One of my favorite golf courses, particularly off the tee with the way the bunkering is. Um, but yeah, that, that kind of, it, it helped me make mistakes and learn from them without being exposed from a professional point of view. It wasn't really costing me anything, but I was learning a lot from it. And that was, that was, that was really vital for me. It gave me a, a good base and I matured quickly in those six months. Well, apart from beating me by 11 strokes for two rounds at Carnoustie in 2007, do you, do you have any uh, cool stories from those three majors? Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, I have one, but <laughs> um, yeah, when I was younger, I was kind of, uh, I could be temperamental. That's being diplomatic. Um, I'm hearing you. Yeah. And uh, so I was playing with Ogilvy and Tiger at Oakmont. And of course, like, you're playing with Tiger. It's like, I've, I've never even seen the guy in real life before. So um, it was pretty daunting. So anyway, I play the first round. I play kind of okay throwaway shots. And um, Bill I was talking about. And then... Second round, I'm like, right, let's get off to a good start. I'm teeing off 10. So I hit this great drive down there and I knock it up. Uh, falls into the rough. I hack it out. I've got 50 uh, gatways left in. So I hit it to like 15 feet and then a three putt. And my big thing was like, get off to a fast start and I make six on the first hole, double bogey. And there's a walk through to the 11th tee and it's like a 200 yard walk through trees. And I'm kind of lagging behind. I made double bogey. So um, my caddy's gone ahead of me. I'm swinging the putter. And I'm like, this is not a good idea having the putter in my hand because I just feel like I want to throw it away. And there's a there's a portaloo like halfway down the, the walkway. And there's nobody there. And I just rattle this portaloo with the, with the putter. And uh, keep walking. And as I walk up to the tee, I look up, I can see Squirrel, who's Jeff Ogilvie's caddy, Jeff Ogilvie, Steve Williams, my caddy, and no Tiger Woods. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, F. <laughs> so, so he comes up and he just looks up and I'm like, I'm in the back trying to hide like behind my caddy because... I've just absolutely rattled this portaloo and he's obviously been inside. He must have got the shock of his life. Um, because it was like a players only portaloo. And uh, and after after that, I was like, I just try to keep my distance and stay in the background as much as possible. Um, so he didn't mention it after it? He didn't mention it, but he, as he looked up, there was a there was a glance and I was like, I was like, oh, I thought he was gonna go absolutely off, but he was he was okay. He just looked at me as if to say, like, like I know that was you. <laughs> um, so yeah, he wasn't. He wasn't my biggest fan. He he definitely wasn't uh, my biggest fan that week. It was um, it was a bit childish, but it's funny to look back on it now. <laughs> uh, how did you How did you uh, prepare and approach uh, Augusta National that year? Did you go up there and have a few games uh, prior, which you're allowed to do? Yeah, I um. I was really lucky. Um, they sent me all the information and, and asked what I would like to do. And I said, well, I was going out to the States in January and I got to go to Augusta. Um, I went there for five days. I played every day for five days. And it was just like unbelievable, like totally could. It, it was quite quiet, so I could go anywhere. And then members would come and let me through and that. I was hitting balls up onto the top of the slopes and letting them come all the way down, just like I seen on the TV. Um, hitting shots from everywhere you could imagine, just trying to get an idea of where the pins were, how I could access them. You know what the what it was like to chip off that grass, which is kind of cut into it into the grain, um, and just understand the green complexes. And and if a pin was on the left, like where you wanted to hit it to come in from, um, if you miss your spot by two yards, where's the ball going to end up? You know, lag putts, which are up 
onto tiers or, or down into flat areas. Um, so I just spent, I just spent pretty much like five, six hours on the golf course a day. Um, and it was brilliant because by the time I got there, I knew the course inside out. I knew it in my head. I could imagine all the green complexes. And I just think, I think sometimes like these guys get to, get to play there before the masses. I just wonder why some of them don't go up there for three, four days. Cause it's just a, it's a m magical place. Mm. It's the only place, one of the few places in the world that I've gone with a really high expectation level and it just blew me away like it was it was beyond my wildest dreams and it's a it's an incredible place did you get to stay in the crow's nest uh, the week of the masters yeah I, I stayed up there um half the week and then I moved into a hotel for the for the for the rest of the week um because I wanted to kind of get the experience but at the same time I, I didn't want to be you know like literally golfed out um but i remember it's cool you come down from the crow's nest and you walk into there's like a dining area below you and then you walk out into a balcony and you're pretty much facing out on that i think there's a, there's a huge oak tree you kind of face out into that into the first tee um and it's just such a cool place and they do everything so well um and they couldn't with regards to an amateur they couldn't look after you enough um, and it, it's one of those places that I would love, love to get back to, but it's, it's a very, very tough task. <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, let's talk about your, uh, DP world tour career. Uh, first of all, if I was to ask you to describe your 15 year professional career, how, how would you sum it up in a nutshell? Consistently hardworking, I would say, and, and the consistency because, I've always been a very steady player. Um, I never give up. I apply myself, and it shows in my results, which tend to be quite consistent and um, just just steady. Um, you know, with little. I feel like when I get a a sniff of a, a win, I feel like I'm I'm quite good under the gun. When you first turned pro and first got out on tour, did you have any? mentors or, or anyone that you looked up to helping you guide you out there not too much there was there was obviously you know it was the time you had Paul Laurie being from Aberdeen winning the Open in 99 when I was 15 16 um but I was I was lucky there was a few of us you know George Murray was about the same age he was coming out in tour Scott Jameson was there uh Lloyd was having a crack at it um so there was and Eric Ramsey, Jay McClay, there's a lot of guys, Channels Tour to the main tour that are out there, Reese, Davis, Gareth, Maven. Um so th those are the guys that I would I would I would speak to. And I had a few mentors who were off the course, people that I'd met over the course of my career. Um sometimes even when I was a junior, guys who had just would give me tell me the truth, give it to me straight. And I could ask them questions and I knew that they would give good, solid answers. And and have, having a mentor is, is a huge thing. Um, I think it's I think it's very, very underrated. Well, you referenced earlier that you played the Challenge Tour your first year out in 2008 and you passed, passed that tour with flying colours to earn your uh, DP World Tour card for 2009, kept your card in 2009, and then in 2009... Uh, the wraparound part of the season into 2010, uh, you won in South Africa. Uh, to win so early in your career and to be able to call yourself a tour winner, how special was that? That was that was amazing. What a week that is. And Pearl Valley is a, a, a beautiful place. I've been back there a few times since there. I, I think the, the Winelands just as I Cape Town are a special place. Um and yeah, it was it was in a playoff. Um, played great the last day. I just had a unbelievable mindset that that back nine. Um, and obviously, the pressure was kind of off because I played well three months prior to keep my card. And at that time, you didn't have as many starts. I would say, and there was a lot of pressure. And I felt the the pressure was off. And um, a golf course again that suited me. Uh, and it came down to 
again it came down to a small moment in the playoff and I just I hit a one of my best shots ever uh, under pressure. I remember I had 262 and I hit a three wood to about 15 feet and and, and I just had the two putt to, to win. So that was very, very cool. You picked up two more wins in 2012 in Kranz and then 2015 in Morocco. Kept making very steady progress in the world of professional golf. How much do you, um, I guess, how much do you have to adjust your goals when when you start winning multiple times do you start focusing more intently on the majors and the bigger tournaments and trying to prepare for those i think you you always want to test yourself against the best and and when i played those majors when i was amateur that was brilliant it gave me a kind of um a benchmark but i felt that i had an element of unfinished business because I wasn't, I wasn't even close to being the finished product. And I felt when I played in some world golf events after that, or played in some majors after that, I was I was a lot better equipped to show where I was in in the game. Um, but it's fair to say I lost my way a little bit. I after winning a few times, you get a little bit older. Life changes a bit. You you don't know where you fit. Because you've accomplished enough, and you've you've got some money in the bank, and um, you've been out there a while, and it's kind of, you know, where does that constant motivation come from? And 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 it's fair to say, I lost myself a little bit at times, um, but over the last year, two years, I think I, I've I've kind of got back to. Uh, sounds funny just like a happier place a place where i feel that i can play my best golf and i guess now that you've won a fourth time uh do you feel like you'll be able to sit back and appreciate what you've done a little bit more and a little bit better than the first three times you've won because i guess as a golfer as certainly a professional golfer you're you're always striving for something bigger and better and i mean when you start playing the game and practicing you know you got to putt on the on the putting green to win a major or the Australian Open, Scottish Open, whatever it is, when you actually win big tournaments, uh, not many of us really pat ourselves on the back because you're always striving to get to the next level. But do you feel like you're in a better place to do that now? Oh, yeah. I, th- I think when you're younger, it's kind of you win and then it's like, right, where are we going next week? Like, I need to get there and I need to win again. And I think once you get a little bit older and there's an element of reflection... Um, you understand these times aren't, you know, always going to be there. So it's a case of like really celebrating the moment and, and celebrate and enjoy yourself. Um, you know, you know, might have to take care of some of your, do something nice for your family members, um, for all their support. And it's just a case of like, right, we got to go out and do something here. You know, you've got to, you've got to really celebrate and enjoy the moment because, a lot of the time we, you know, we think about the future and what we want to do and what we need to do, but sometimes it's just like immerse yourself in the moment, realize how good how good this is, and and soak it up and sort of just re- remember it for, um, just how how raw and emotional it was and and um, yeah, it was cool on Sunday night. You got to sit down and sit down there with my caddy and just have a chat and just sort of bring it. Bring it all, bring it all home. Well, look, going back to 2018, uh, heading into the final event at Valderrama, you'd never, you'd never lost your card. You'd been playing out on tour for 10 years, and you headed into that final event uh, outside the top 110 or 115 or whatever it was, and you needed a, a good week to retain your playing privileges. Uh, you've spoken about the pressure of trying to win a tournament down the stretch, but what about knowing you need a good week to keep your job? Uh, definitely harder. Definitely harder. Um, I was very fortunate that week that I had Valderrama, and Valderrama is one of the toughest golf courses you will play, but it suits my game perfectly. And um, I played played really well that week, and I, what, I, what I did was, which I think was key for me playing that well, was at the start of the week I accepted that I might lose my card and I accepted what that would mean. I'd, and it meant that when I played the tournament, I didn't feed it. I'd accepted it in my head that if I didn't play well enough, I was going to lose my card. Right, that's fine. But what can we do this week? 
same ideas every other week, try and be the best you can be. Unfortunately, there was a huge rain delay and it went into the next day and I had seven holes to play. So I had another sort of night to sleep on it. I birdied my first hole when I came back and I parred the last six holes. I made it tough at the end because I knocked on the green and I had 20 feet and all you're thinking is your head, like just roll it down, roll it down, tap it in, get out here because I sensed that if I made par, it was going to be good enough. And of course I hit this putt and it took off like the road runner and I'm like, oh no, get down, get down. And as I walked down to it, I was like, this is not what I want. I've got like four feet left to right on lightning fast greens. Uh, and I was just like, oh, right, this is this is it. Like, y- y- it's either it, it goes in, you get your card or it doesn't go in. And you're like, like I, I don't even want to deal with the consequences. Um, I managed, it, managed to, to hold it out. And that was such a satisfying week. But it, it was a good kick up the arse as well made me realize like mm. some things I wasn't doing so well, some things that um, with regards to attitude and applying myself that I need to get better at. You hold a similar length putt to win two weeks ago at Hillside. Which one was bigger in the grand scheme of your career? The one to keep your job at Valderrama? I would, yeah, I would, I would say the one at Valderrama, but just because it can set off a chain of events that it can spiral out of control pretty quickly. Um, And I'd always prided myself on being consistent and I'd never been in that situation before. Whereas at Hillside, I'd been in that situation before where I need to make a putt. And if I didn't make it, I was in a playoff. So you kind of got a little bit of an insurance there. Whereas the card was like, no, if you don't make it, that's it. Like you can't take it again. There's no like you can tap it in and make five and, and you might just get your card. It's like, no, it's like you, you don't hold this, like it's done. Um, so from that perspective, it was, um, it was, it was definitely harder. Well, as we speak, you're currently 20th on the race to Dubai standing. So you've got an exemption through till the end of 2024. What does your schedule look like for the rest of this season? And what are, uh, what are your goals now going forward? Yeah, I, I need to, honestly, I need to really s- sit down and, and have a think about where I go from here. Um, the goal at the start of the year was to win, but definitely getting to race to Dubai was, was a big thing. Um, I wasn't that far away from it the last couple of years, but um, I just, I feel that Race Dubai, is, it's, it's, it's a brilliant tournament, uh, set at a fantastic place on a, on a time of year is just, it's just brilliant. And that, it's one of those places that you can take people out, family, friends, and you can really kind of reward them for all the work that they put in. And it's all the stuff that they do for you that, people don't see and it's one of those weeks where you can kind of really let them enjoy some of your success um so i'm going to start back up in in cranser sierra place obviously i've done well i played denmark bmw i'm going to take a week off and then i'm going to play probably four or five in a row uh then maybe two weeks off and then the last two um so trying trying to get a balance between playing and uh, a little bit of time off and and obviously that finale at Race to Dubai, which is I'm obviously in a good position to. I'd like to cement it and, and, and move a little bit higher. But um, yeah, I probably need to sit down and readdress a short-term goal between now and then that would be ni- a nice thing to accomplish. Well, whenever your playing career winds up, I know you have a real affinity for golf course architecture. Is that... A route, is that a route that you'll um that you'll try and pursue? Do you think? Definitely, for sure. It's um, and you you understand this like anything you do in your life, and you spend a lot of time. You need to have it needs to come from your heart, and you need to have a passion for it. You need it needs to be something that like occupies your mind that you think about that um 
you really want to get right and and the architecture side of it is something that I really love I I, I you know it, it's like a every golf course is kind of like a puzzle and and you're kind of you're trying to find the best way to do it and from traveling and playing different golf courses you understand what is good and what's bad um and particularly we're at a really funny stage in golf where there's a gap between the average player and the tour player and a lot of clubs are trying to make their course harder for the better or the tour player but you still need to make it playable for your average member 51 weeks of the year and um yeah, I'm just trying to learn as much as possible. I'm, I'm trying to play golf courses that are different. I'm trying to read, you know, about, um, I've got, you know, I love reading about Tom Simpson and he, and some of the work, um, he did actually at Muirfield, um, on the 13th hole, the par three, you know, um, you know, I love listening to Mike Clayton. I think you'll probably know from then that he's quite, um, straight talking. Is that <laughs> Yeah. But yeah. um, his knowledge is brilliant. I got to meet Tom Doak the other year, and just you know, I think it. I think the way he roots courses is exceptional. Um, and then when you break all these things down, you realize how how hard it is. What what so much it entails. And I've been fortunate to play in Australia, um, and I love the courses down there. I love. Uh, I also love the courses here. But you know, I've kind of got a hit list. And it's, you know, some of the courses in the Surrey Sand Belt, a few in Long Island. Um, and then I would love, when I retire, I'd love to go to Japan, down through New Zealand, um, and then go out to Tasmania and come back and play like Royal Melbourne. Because it's just, those courses just are stunningly beautiful, endless fun to play, and... um just an enthralling like challenge um yeah and it's kind of soaking up all that influence and trying to have my own design philosophy for the future i would say the majority of professional golfers find it very very difficult to play golf socially and for fun but that doesn't sound like to me you'd have an issue with that you could easily go and play with your friends and just take it all in yeah yeah i mean i'm fortunate i'm a like I say, I'm I brought up at Royal Aberdeen. I love playing there, and East Lothian's just around the corner for me as well. So there's there's so many cool golf courses to play. Um, I have a you know a real soft spot for for Muirfield and St Andrews and and Loch Lomond. And I sit kind of between the three of those. So anytime I get to play those three, um, is a real treat for me. And um, yeah, I just I just love going out on good golf courses with good people like good positive people and having a laugh and trying to enjoy the challenge of the course but also taking all the intricacies that you sometimes don't don't see when you play it especially when you play it the first time um you know, you know it's like i i always i, I listened to i think gil hans was describing golf courses and and it's like, well, why does one course, why is one course way better than another? And he said something along the lines of, well, if you think about it, it's a little bit like music. Everybody starts with the same stuff. You got bunkers, you know, mounds, you're going to have greens, you're going to have tees. But it's how you arrange that and the formation you do that, just like music. Everybody starts with the, the same notes, but some some music like is is absolutely fantastic and people get emotional about it and I think it's the same with golf courses it's how you arrange it and it takes I I really believe it takes a semi-genius to, to, to build a course that people can enjoy not once not twice but over and over again um, and in this in this time that we're in I think experience like that counts for so much more now the experience and the and the kind of um the feeling you get when you're on a good course and the, the memories you have from it it's it's endless fun and endless uh positivity 
Well, Richie Ramsey, thanks so much for coming on the Life on Tour podcast today. It's been terrific to learn about your career and uh, congratulations once again on the win at Hillside and we look forward to following your career this year and, uh, and beyond. Thanks very much. Thanks for, thanks for taking the time. To watch another DP World Tour video, click here and to subscribe, click here.